a little overview of, of what we get done in an aesthetic clinic with laser resurfacing. Um, we use two primary techniques. One is uh, non-ablative laser resurfacing and the other is ablative resurfacing of which we can both of those techniques can be subdivided into more fully ablative where we're treating the whole surface area of the skin and fractional ablative where we're actually treating columns of tissue and leaving intact tissue behind between those columns and that is principally for the purposes of quicker healing which obviously as you know being all uh, practitioners in the aesthetic market no one likes to be down for a long time so let's have a look at some common clinic indications for treatment with laser resurfacing so with uh, ablative methods uh, we're often using uh, devices like the CO2 laser uh, and the erbium YAG laser. These uh, are very, very well absorbed by water in tissues and as a result uh, cause vaporization of those tissues. Depending on the wavelength that you're using, there's a differing degree of thermal damage uh, to the tissue underneath. That is, if, if you're using an ablative laser, you can do things like rejuvenate the face, treat rightids, probably deeper rightids, moderate rightids, um, Acne scarring is an area where we will use the lasers quite a lot. And removal of simple epidermal and dermal lesions uh, is something we should do quite often with the ablative laser as well. Non-ablative lasers um, we often are uh, using for uh, photo-aging, rejuvenation of the face, finer writeds. Uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion, it has more limited applications in the treatment of acne scarring. Um, and often because of the penetration depth with these devices we're talking about treating things at the up to the epidermal dermal junction junctional lesions pigmentation in that area as well so this is some work that was done by Sasaki et al uh, in 2009 published in the journal of cosmetic laser dermatology and it is a slide that I have found exceedingly important when thinking about laser resurfacing 121 patients had varying degrees of, uh, sorry, uh, various areas of their um, uh, skin sampled uh, and the thickness, the average thicknesses were looked at. Um, and as you can see, uh, we, we all know that there are varying skin thicknesses on the body, but areas like uh, the lateral cheek have a nice thick uh, skin layer and obviously areas such as the eyelid have a uh, much thinner sort of layer, 0.5 millimeters versus 2 millimeters. Now, it's very important to consider this to a very accurate level when we're talking about laser and depth of penetration because obviously, you know, when we are adjusting devices and adjusting parameters, we are in fact very often adjusting the depth of penetration. And if we go wrong with that, particularly in areas like the eye, particularly with fractional devices, you risk causing damage to structures below the skin. So you must, must be very aware of skin thickness and this slide is available to you all I think in, in module four as well to, to have a look at for it. Another very important thing when planning laser ablation or, or, or laser resurfacing is the density of treatment. Now the skin's ability to recover depends on the presence of adnexal structures within the skin. So if you have a, f a low density of adnexal structures, areas such as the neck and the chest, if you do aggressive laser procedures in this area, you'll be fraught with a lot of problems, uh, scarring, uh, you'll be pro having problems with prolonged recovery, uh, prolonged erythema, uh, and the outcome might be rather worse than you would expect. And that's because the potential of these areas to skin, uh, sorry, of these areas of skin to heal is much, much reduced. So you can be more aggressive on the face. Funnily enough, that might not be intuitive. You think the face is a very delicate area, we be very careful. Of course we do. But in terms of healing, adnexal structure, structure density on the face is, is, is much greater than, for example, like say in neck and chest and the extremities of the body. So what's actually happening in the skin when we're doing this? Um, effectively, we are ablating tissue 
In these lower slides, you see what fractional ablation looks like. If we're doing non-ablative, these orange lines within the skin are not holes. They're actually columns of coagulated tissue. Uh, using a wavelength such as 1550 or 1410, 1550, what you're effectively doing is you're creating heat but not vaporizing the water in the tissues. That tissue temperature increases above 60 to it's about 60 to 90 degrees Celsius and that causes coagulative damage to the tissue. As a result, that tissue is then slowly broken down, neocollagenesis occurs and you get new organized collagen that will fill those areas. With the ablated fractional laser, what you're actually doing is you're actually drilling holes. So this is different, you're drilling holes and you're actually completely removing the tissue. Now, if I take your attention to the above two pictures, as well as drilling holes, you see the orange zone around the white zone. That is a zone of thermal coagulation. So here you have the dual effect of ablating the tissue and creating thermal coagulation around it. So it's basically a much larger amplification of the non-ablative treatment to use the ablative treatment. If we're using uh, just non-ablative low power laser, then we'll just take, basically use it creating bulk tissue heating and coagulation. So here's a little bit more of a histolo histological prep, prep slide of, of what's going on in the skin. If we're using an ablative laser with an erbium YAG laser, because it's so well absorbed by tissue water, you create a nice punch hole in the skin but limited thermal coagulative damage around the skin. That has implications for recovery. So if you want to do an ablative treatment that has lower downtime, you would probably be better off using your erbium laser or a fractional erbium device because the healing will be much quicker because thermal damage to anexal structures is much, much less. With the CO2 laser, it's much more coagulative than the erbium YAG laser. You have a zone of coagulation around the punch hole that measures around about 100 microns. You can adjust this these days with some certain lasers. You can actually adjust how much coagulation you're going to have also just by adjusting the pulse width of the laser. But effectively, that causes tissue contraction as well. Tissue contraction is very useful in correcting laxity problems, in collect, correcting writing. So using the CO2 laser may be more potent for things like that, but the extra damage you're conferring to the skin will result in um, you know, a, a longer healing time in general. But the impressive thing that you can see, even when you're stamping skin or you're doing a scanning pattern of CO2 drill holes, you can actually see the skin contract before your eyes. This is why it's such a powerful device uh, for treatment of rejuvenation as well. So, laser is a very safe and measured approach. I put this slide in because this is a Fitzpatrick 4 skin type and as you probably know on Fitzpatrick 4 skin types, the last thing you want to do is cause pigmentation abnormalities because they get very upset, as anyone would. But, you know, um, effectively you can control laser skin damage and density very precisely. A chemical peel to achieve this level of effect would probably be using something like a Jesner combined with a 25% TCA. And, you know, experience with anyone that has done a lot of chemical peels will probably tell you that you're starting to step into risky territory. I, mean, I would guess that not many people would do Jesner's 25% TCA on a lady like this without not losing a little bit of sleep over it overnight. Um, but with the uh, non-ablative laser, as you can see that I've used the 1927 wavelength here, I've effectively taken off her epidermis and caused a little bit of thermal coagulative uh, damage to the superficial papillary dermis. But as you can see, within a week, she has recovered quite well and the junctional lesions which she was more worried about, these lentiginous lesions on the side of her cheek, nicely reduced, not completely rude, but nicely reduced. We can use the fractional CO2 at a rather more low level to achieve similar. Uh, in Caucasian skin we get the added benefit of a little bit more thermal contraction. You can deal with the photoaging but you can also deal with fine writers around the eyes and the mouth and not give them too much downtime because you're not doing too, too deep a treatment and the fractional density is a little bit lower here. Acne scarring. Lots of people 
talk about lasers and acne scarring. It's actually not just lasers and acne scarring. It's a multi-modality uh, approach. So uh, there are different types of acne scars that you're aware of, and they have varying depths within the skin. Ice pick scars, uh, box car scarring, rolling and tethered scars. These are pretty tough to treat because they actually have um, uh, fibrous tethering to the, to the SMAS layer underneath, which is quite difficult to get rid of just with a laser. So we have to use many techniques in the treatment of acne scarring. It's not just acne scarring, laser it somehow. So, Ice pick scars I'll often surgically remove with a two millimeter punch. Uh, sometimes I'll use TCA cross to try and close them down a little bit more uh, with 90% TCA applied with a 30 gauge needle within the scar itself. Um, box cast scarring is something that responds very well to full ablation uh, and shouldering of the scars is something I do very often with my erbium laser just to improve the, the contours, the, the sharp contours of the box car scar. Rolling and tethered scars are rather more difficult and I've uh, been using uh, slightly newer methods. I'm sure Hemmer will probably be aware of uh, Mark Taylor's method of full field subcision under tumescent anesthesia. It's something we've been using uh, recently after going and meeting with him in Salt Lake. Um, effectively using a, a high flow uh, tumescent anesthesia pump to hydro dissect the cheek and create nice uh, closure of the perforating vessels with the adrenaline and the tumescent mix and then use quite a large probe to literally slide in the superficial cutaneous plane and dissect all those tetherings and then when you see those pop nicely up, you've already done quite a large bit of your work and then you can accompany that directly with this, the, the fractional CO2 laser to achieve a nice complete result. This gentleman here is having a little bit of uh, full field erbium ablation to box car scars. Um, you can see what we've done here is we've marked out areas of significant scarring and here I'm literally using the erbium YAG laser to shoulder the scars and effectively sort of ablating those shoulders down and using a, a little bit of a longer pulse which creates a little bit of thermal contraction under there and coagulative damage and that smooths off those box car scars quite nicely. You can't subsize box car scars and if you punch excise them you create large scars. So the laser is very useful in this scenario. And you can see I've, I've not done an after but I've done a, I just wanted to show you what kind of sort of after effects immediately afterwards go on with this quite kind of procedure. So you can see it's a much more invasive procedure than, than some of us are used to uh, and the recovery we have to monitor these people very carefully in the recovery period as they're susceptible to all kinds of problems which I'll talk about later. This is a gentleman who had uh, tethered rolling acne scars, which are quite difficult to treat. This is a gentleman we did our first uh, tumescent anesthesia subcision uh, with fractional laser. Uh, and as you can see, there's, uh, the, the, uh, the lighting has not come out very well, but I've tried to done, do the lighting at an angle so you can appreciate the relief of the scars. And uh, this is probably, I think, about six, seven days down the line. Uh, it's still a little bit of dermatis, but you can see that those scars have popped out quite nicely just with the subcision alone. So, you know, the, the fractional, uh, the, 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 the advantage of the tumescence is you can go straight over afterwards with your fractional laser and the subdermal plexus gives you quite a good um, sort of anastomotic link under the skin. So even though the tools might knock out a few of the perforator vessels, you still have reasonably good skin healing after the procedure. This is just to show you that we can use procedures on the neck. This is a relatively light procedure on the neck using only 300 micrometers of depth and a fractional density of 20%, which is not exceptional. But recovery is long and even about uh, sort of a week to 10 days afterwards, you still got erythema. So, you know, this is a tricky area with lasers. You can do mild laser treatments, but when you start to get significant laxity and significant rightids, laser cannot be upgraded in these areas without causing problems. Perioral rightids tend to respond quite well uh, to uh, erbium uh, YAG uh, laser and also CO2 laser. Here's a little bit of uh, erbium YAG laser just uh, shortly after we performed it. And here's a pre and post of some perioral rightids treated with erbium YAG laser alone. So um, effectively, um, you know, you can, you can use it with fillers as an adjunct or you can use it on its own depending on, you know, your preference there. Um, 
periocular rejuvenation, a little bit more of an advanced indication with lasers. You've got to be very careful. You've got to be making sure you're protecting the eye adequately uh, with a metal eye shield. Uh, but remember, it's not just about laser. You use laser synergistically. If you don't collect correct volume loss, if you don't correct uh, movement issues, you won't get the optimal correction. If you don't uh, correct the lid cheek junction, the lack of sooth, uh, you know, you, you won't get a, a beautiful overall effect. You need to treat the eye holistically. So you need to use all techniques together. Laser can help because, like I said, it helps with skin laxity, it helps with tightening the skin, and it helps with resurfacing the skin. Here, very often, I tend to use my uh, uh, erbium Miag laser on the upper lid. It's a little bit more uh, safer to do. Uh, it's, it's, it, you can be a bit more safe on the upper lid with, with a more aggressive, fully ablative technique. Uh, in the lower lid, I tend to stick to a fractional CO2 um, uh, procedure, I use a device called the core. It's got a little bit of a longer pulse width, so you get that little bit more of uh, thermal coagulation around your uh, punch holes. Um, these are typical parameters that I might use uh, for light sort of uh, laxity, but for more deep or, deeper right, it's around the lower eyelid. Uh, I would go for a uh, slightly deeper penetration, but lower density treatment. Um, Non-ablative lasers, one thing that's nice about these non-ablative lasers, like I say, you can use them uh, for low downtime procedures and you can get a lot of um, full field uh, photo damage treated uh, very easily. So, you know, when people will come to use, very often sometimes uh, with people with lasers in their clinics might say, okay, you've got a few, few lens tigers, let's just treat them individually with a Q-switch laser. Now, if you're treating pigmentation individually with a Q-switch laser, laser, it's great, but blending the areas treated afterwards can be a little bit of an issue because you'll see a demarcation around the areas that you've treated. This tends to happen less with a full field treatment. I generally go along with the policy of if there's a full field issue, try some sort of full field treatment and try not to be bitty with your treatment. So here with the 1927 wavelength, your chromophore is water. However, it doesn't vaporize the tissue, it coagulates the tissue. So it basically causes a 250 micrometer coagulation of the epidermis, which you can control the density of. In many cases, the laser only allows treatment up to 60% density, but I will go very often to 100% density and just remove the whole layer of tissue uh, and, and, and you get a very nice, uh, it's, it's, it's equivalent of a, a medium depth peeling of the skin, but because of the way laser energy is administered versus chemical, uh, chemical peels, the, the risk of side effects in pigmentation is much lower with this device. Um, so, things that I might use the erbium fiber laser, which is the 1927 non ablative to use, uh, things like freckles, solar lens tigers, macular sep case, epidermal melasma, um, a case, uh, actinic keratosis can also be treated quite effectively. You'd be using much more higher density, so probably uh, effectively using the device at a sort of 80, 90, 100% density. Um, and fine, because of, the, because of the thermal effect of the laser, you get improvements on fine writers and textural abnormalities as well. The Erbium Yag laser you can use to treat deeper lesions within the skin. Here's a quick example of uh, uh, a sort of quick treatment with the Erbium Yag laser to an intradermal nevus. Uh, this lady uh, had uh, worked as a teacher. Unfortunately, one of the uh, children, her story is very funny, one of the children said she looked like a witch because of her uh, her mole, and I thought that's very, very harsh. Children are very harsh. Um, so uh, she then, having had this all her life, decided she wanted it now removed. And as you can see in sub one minute, we have removed it bloodlessly with minimal damage to a nexal structure. So the healing from this is very, very fast. That's one of the advantages to doing conventional shave excision and using cautery, uh, the speed of healing. This is just, uh, I think, about 10 days, two weeks down the line post uh, removal of that lesion. So you can see it's healing up pretty quickly and that eventually will die down and not be so pink and be a nice flat little white area that will be hardly noticeable. Here I've used the device to remove multiple seborrheic keratosis in a lady who was going on holiday. I don't know whether it was to Capri, but somewhere nice. And she was going to be wearing her bikini and she didn't want these warty lesions all over her back to, to compromise uh, her sexy bikini. So we decided that uh, 
she'd had previous cryo and she'd had ring-like remnants around the cryo and some hyperpigmented patches. The beauty of the erbium laser is that we can take it down a little bit into the dermis, make sure we get none of those little uh, warty rings that are left following treatment. Uh, minimally painlessly, I didn't use much in the way of anesthetic here as well, and she just mani managed to sort of quote maximum five out of six discomfort. Uh, and you know, here, because we were doing a lot of lesions, we did this treatment and it was probably sub 10 minutes, five to 10 minute treatment, all removed very, very effectively and no remnants and the healing. Uh, probably a little bit of erythema about a week later, but this settled down very rapidly. Complications quickly before I round off. Um, when we're doing laser ablation, remember we are reducing the skin's immunity. We are uh, you, uh, reducing its barrier immunity. So viral infection, uh, reactivation of HSV uh, uh, type issues is a very common thing. Very often we'll give prophylaxis for this post-treatment with uh, 400 milligrams BD of acyclovir. Uh, bacterial infections, usually typically staph, strep, pseudomonas, sometimes uh, you have to keep a close eye out for these. Uh, candle infections as well. Uh, obviously there's dispigmentation problems that can result, uh, which is why you have to carefully think about depth of penetration, fractional density. Prolonged erythema is another problem. Obviously the recovery has largely occurred, but they're still quite red and this is quite bothersome to them. Post resurfacing contact dermatitis, very, very co relatively common problem in aggressive resurfacing procedures. Hypertrophic scarring, so think about isotretinoin, all these things I'm going to talk about later in the laser oski, and acne breakout. So you have to monitor these people. The take home message from that is monitor these people. Monitor these people closely. Rather than dealing with complications in this sense, I like to pick them up immediately when they occur and treat aggressively because you don't want them to run rife and someone come to you a week later and say I've been having an infection for a week now deal with the consequences you need to pick that up quickly and have a low index of suspicion